So I'm very thankful to have Dr. Chandler, our first speaker for the series, and I will let him begin his presentation on implementing inquiry-based learning techniques. Awesome, thank you. So this practice that I'm making use of actually came out of some work I did throughout my um, graduate school days. I was a facilitator in an in content-intensive style workshop called Aura and the Merton Scholars Program. And so I took a lot of techniques that I learned out of that setting and I still integrate them into the classroom even though we don't have those content intensive workshops at the same level here that we did there. So let me kind of give a little bit of a background on what that is. Basically, there was a grant written at UTA and a couple of other institutions uh, building off the work of Yuri Treisman that was done in order to intervene with populations of students that were not doing as well as statistically they should have in math and science courses. And so what UTA did is they took a cohort of the freshman students in STEM fields and in several of their classes, including Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, they implemented a optional two hour a week workshop where the students would come in and work with a different instructor who was connected to their original course and would only work on material that was above and beyond what was covered in the lecture. And when I say above and beyond, I don't mean they were doing very advanced things, but they were going more in depth than the material they were learning that they didn't necessarily have time to do in class. And we saw a lot of really good results. Pass rates went for that cohort went from about 50% to 75%. And we implemented this for a number of years until the grant ran out. And then about that same time is when I left UTA. And since then, they tried modifying it somewhat. And they still seem to see nice results. So everything you see here is kind of a modification of what you're seeing there, and that's what I've implemented in my classes here. And um, I've had it to work well. There are a few challenges I'm going to talk about, um, mainly with student expectations, and I'll bring those up in here. Okay, so I wasn't sure of exactly um, how much of a back a lot of people have. So inquiry-based learning is basically active learning where you take, rather than giving them material to sit and work on that is just rote or something that is mimicking what you saw in the lecture, it's questions that you pose that they're going to have to sit and think about. And not just look through their notes and kind of go, oh, here's an example that matches it. It's normally some sort of problem solving that has to go on. And the way I implement it, I want it to also involve a lot of group work and a lot of collaboration because I'm trying to all build that community amongst students. So my objectives when I'm trying to build an inquiry-based learning activity is I want it to first and foremost provide success in the course and their later courses. So I don't want it to be something that I just kind of throw in there to make them do group work. I want it to be meaningful, I want it to integrate well, and I want it to be extra information that they're going to learn that in later courses they're going to be able to pull on and go, oh, I'm glad I learned that in Cal 1. Um, I want it to be academically challenging. I think all of us have done group work before that has failed miserably. And it just it takes good response. They, they don't um, engage with each other. And most of that time, in my what I see, is because the material you're presenting is not challenging enough for them to actually need to work in a group. They, if, if a student doesn't need to work in a group, they're not going to work in a group. It's just the fact. Um, we want them to be able to grow. Uh, grow academically. Oh, that's supposed to be another bullet. <laughs> want them to academically. We want them to stimulate their further interests. They 
especially in things like mathematics, a lot of times you have students who are in a math major, if they're a major, they're in the math major because they're good at math, not necessarily because they like math, or the other way around. And then a lot of students that we did in, let's say, Calculus One, College Algebra, are biology students. Um, College Algebra, you might be English students. You're not supposed to be in there, sometimes you do. And you want to try to build things that are going to help pique their interest a little bit more. You know, the more interest they have, the more vote motivation they'll have. And then, you know, I also wanted to facilitate group work and bring about community building. You build a community during these few activities you do, they'll study together for their exams, and then in subsequent courses. Okay, so some of the challenges that we see with this. Um, so these are just some questions that have always come up and I get asked a lot when I talk about this. How do you motivate students to go what is beyond the test? And I, I get this a lot still where I'll do an image-based activity and halfway through the students turn around and go to the channel oh my gosh, this is so hard. What part of this do I need to know for the test? And my response to them is normally, the ideas that we're going to learn in here will help you to better understand the material on the test, but know that this is much more advanced than what I would ask them for the test. And so it gives them motivation to actually learn it, but it doesn't stress them out to the point that they're like, oh my gosh, I have to know how to do this problem that took us four pages as a group. Um, and the, the issue with what's on the test is a careful one to balance with this because if you tell them up front that no, this will never appear on a test, a lot of times you'll get students who are just like, I'm not going to do it. Okay, but another way that I'll often phrase it is, is a problem like this but more simple will make my hair on the test. So they still need to learn the material but they're not going to stress out about this particular problem. And I make that clear normally at the beginning of the inquiry based activities. I'll say, hey guys, remember, this is going to be a challenging day. Um, this is more challenging than what we've done in a lot of our stuff so far. So just be aware that there's a spike in cruelty, but you'll be okay. How do you simulate the best students while not overwhelming the others? Okay, so you get this a lot. If you, You've got students who will finish the entire activity in two minutes by themselves. And then you've got the students who are sitting there in a group dying, okay, just trying to grab any sort of knowledge they can. Um, in my opinion, for this, I have found a great practice for it is to take your groups and very carefully build them. And I prefer groups of three or four. I do five when it's absolutely necessary, but I truly do not like doing five, and I'll talk about why in a bit. Um, but it, I have found it kind of helps if you plan your groups with a high performer, a medium performer, and a low performer, or high two and a low, and that way they can kind of interact as an intermediary between the high and the low, and you can get some good results out of it. Because normally one or two of the mediums will kind of turn around to the person who's not in one being like, hey, are you understanding what they're saying? can go well, here, and the high performer might still kind of be doing their own thing, but then that same mediator is going, whoa, is that what you're doing here? And you get some nice group interaction. Uh, how do you make students believe that they are expected to excel and capable of doing so? I think that this is the hardest question here, because we have students that will pretty much kind of say, I'm expected, this is beyond what I'm expected to do. And this is really hard, and it's okay that I'm not doing it because nobody should be expected to do this. And you see this a lot. And I would say some of the best ways to do this is to kind of scaffold your activities. And I'm going to put up an example of an activity in, uh, in a little bit. And the best way that I found to handle it is to actually build it to where there are, you have, let's say, five questions on the activity for them to work on. 
do one to two that are pretty straightforward, do two or so that are more medium level, and then do one that's pretty challenging. And the students can kind of work their way up and get a feel for the easy ones. And it could be that at the beginning of the semester, they're only doing the easy ones. And by the end, they can start doing the moderate and more difficult ones. And it kind of fosters that escalate level of success that they're looking for. Um, I would be very shocked if you can ever find students who the class as a whole can just jump in on one of these activities and complete the whole thing flawlessly without feeling like they're doing something above and beyond what they need to. Um, it, it is an open process. And then how do you evaluate productivity in a group setting? Well, <laughs> that's a challenge. Um, I have some practices to talk to you about that come from a book that I actually found years ago. And they're actually pretty good at evaluating productivity. One of the best things I can tell you is to know your students. Um, if you have a really good working relationship with students and know what their brains are, what their weaknesses are, and what their social interactions are, you can actually pretty easily walk by a group and pretty much tell them what they're on task or not. And the level of on task you're looking for, I think, also depends on your goal. Because in my content consensus workshops, if they were 90% on task, 80% on task, I was okay with it because they were two hour long workshops. And I don't expect students to just sit there and hammer out mathematics for two hours straight. So if they're on task, but then somebody like picks up their phone and shows a meme and then kind of comes back and gets back to work, I'm okay with that. I'm, I want to be low stress environment. You don't want them to feel like they're pressured to work on this stuff. The best learning will occur when they feel comfortable. And if that means they finish part of the problem, throw their pencil down, and go, oh my gosh, that's hard. Here, you don't want to show them that. That's fine for me. So when I get these activities, um, this pretty much is a pretty good uh, illustration of how I want the day to go, regardless of how long I have. So if I'm doing a full every day content, Intensive workshop, it would be like two hours. If it's here, I tend to do this in, let's say, the recitation for our Cal 1 course, which is 50 minutes to an hour. So it's about half the time, but it's still pretty much a pretty quick going on. You need a few minutes to the classroom. Um, I have part of their assignment each day is to either work on a board or just work in a group where they're kind of displaying their work. Uh, boards work best, honestly, but you can also do it with, um, on a table or something, and I'll show you what I mean. And then the bulk of the time has been collapsing on the activity. And you see that there's time for individual work up there. That individual work could be they're stuck and kind of broken from the past and are working. And I'll let them do that a little bit because everybody needs their own time to kind of think and not be bombarded by everybody else's ideas. But you can see, you don't let that happen for too long. If you've got things you start to pull away from the group, you give them a few minutes to think, and if they're not back in there within, you know, five minutes, they kind of go, hey, what, what's your group doing right now? Or why are, you, why are you not working with your group? And if they say, well, I've been trying to figure this out, I'll say, okay, well, why don't you make what you've done? back into your group and see if they can get it further. Okay, so keep pushing them in there. And then instructor-led discussion, normally part of the group work time is also then presenting something, at least a small part of it. And then the discussion is going to be me either prompting the other groups to add input or um, connecting the dots between the problems that they might have worked on or what we covered in lecture. And I'll say, well, you remember that concept we covered in the lecture and we only spent a few minutes on it? How do you think that might relate to this? And try to make those connections. And but again, you see, there's not a lot of time out of these allocated to working individually or meeting the center of attention. The students 
So the first thing is when you're creating inquiry-based problem-solving activity, when you make it and then before the student step in the room, the first thing you need to do is you need to anticipate the student's likely response. Okay, so, and I think most of us do this when we write our exams and so forth. We think about where the students are going to mess up. I'm writing a test, I get to work, I'm like, oh, that's a tricky step. Okay, they're probably going to lose some points here. And I either decide I want to see if they're going to fix that or that tricky is something I'm not going to do. Okay, so, and it's not just negative, but you want positive, you want negative. You want to kind of have an idea as to where the students are going to go with it. And then be aware that you're probably going to be wrong for at least one or two of your groups. Once you have that, you want to start monitoring. So this is when the students actually start. Now, for the monitoring of the groups, at the very beginning, if you're not used to running an inquiry based task, you can actually physically write things down. Okay? And the book itself here actually gives a chart you can use, and the chart basically says, like, what group, what did you do, uh, comment through yourself, and then there's a cost to decide that you decide if you want to have them present out what sequence you want them to present in. Um, I can tell you that the first semester I did this, I was much less confident. And so for the anticipating likely student responses, I actually worked out every single problem on my activity every week. And that is very intensive. And if you can get to a point where you don't have to do that, it's great for a number of reasons I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then for monitoring, I actually kept a notepad with me. And I would actually write down what I was seeing. After several weeks, I felt comfortable enough that I was able to just kind of look and go, okay, this group's doing this, this group's doing this. I had to intervene on this group on this problem. And so I was able to kind of just keep in mind the general overall view of what I was seeing. Um, I found when I was trying to write it down, I would often focus too much on what I was writing and trying to get the details, and I was missing other things that were going on. Okay, now depending on your activity, I always recommend um, presenting out at least a little bit at the end, but I understand that sometimes there's just not time to do it. So I would. The next thing is you select to take your student to present. Okay, so this is third practice, select things. Okay, so you go to the group, you think about the groups, and you go and say, okay, I'm going to have this group select this problem for them, I'm going to have this group do this, this group do this. You don't have to give a person from every group, you don't have to do every problem, um, but you normally want some sort of presentation each time just as kind of a, a cohesive what the work was with me. It wasn't just everybody working individually in their groups. Everybody's kind of working together to fit this. You need to sequence the student responses. And even though that seems like kind of a silly step, it's actually very relevant because sometimes you have activities that have a very natural progression and you want an obvious order. But sometimes, like one of the worksheets I'll show, here in a minute, they, there isn't an obvious order per se. And you want to kind of think about what each student is going to present, what comments you're going to make during the presentation that will build it up in a nice way to help reach that goal at the end. So the sequencing is actually one of the more important ones that a lot of times you just don't think about. And then as the instructor, your role at the end, again, is some of the group-based discussions, and you're going to connect the different responses, and then connect them back to what half the classroom. Uh, one of some of the biggest skills I ever saw in my own classes was when maybe the student presentations went long, or students were working very hard, and they weren't ready to present, and I was not able to make the connection at the end. And the students, you know, I would have days where I'd just be like, okay, guys, we ran late. Um, go ahead, have your stuff ready to turn in next week. We'll talk then. 
blah, blah, blah. And then the next week I come in and it's like the week before it never happened. It's like yeah, all that work they did for two hours was just kind of gone. So bringing that connection around at the end actually does help a lot and it puts that stamp on it. Okay, so going along with this, um, I've said a few times here that as the instructor of your job is as the facilitator, not to actually answer their questions, for lack of a better term. I don't answer the questions during these. I really try not to. If there is a group that's really struggling or there is an individual student who I can see is struggling on one topic and maybe they're embarrassed or they don't want to ask the group to struggle how to do it, I'll give a, a quick thing to them. But in general, if a group turns around and goes, is this right? <laughs> I'm not going to answer for that. Um, and what happens is you have to be careful because if you do it even just once, a lot of times you'll, or if you hang around the group a lot, if you have a few groups rather than a bunch, you know, you kind of advocate and I like to join the groups. I'll actually sit down and at the table with them and I'll just listen. But a lot of times if you do it too long or you get yourself answering too many questions, you'll see students go, well, I think this. And then they just turn and stare at you like trying to read your face or they're waiting for you to respond. And I normally just smile. Sometimes I pull my phone out. <laughs> and uh, if they're on the wrong track, the most I normally do is I'll kind of turn around. I'll, as I'm walking away, I'll be like, y'all might want to look at the answer to that third line and I just walk away. Okay, you honestly might drop is the best thing you can do. Just kind of be like, nope, and walk. Because it makes them go, well, why is it wrong? But you're not their help. So now they have, they know it's wrong, they have to figure out why it's like that. So before you actually intervene in a group, there's some questions you should ask yourself. So because our first instinct, if I'm standing in a room and I've got these groups over here, and I hear somebody say something wrong over here, my first instinct is to be like, well, that's that. And I like immediately try to run over there. And you have to stop yourself. Because odds are somebody in that group is going to know that it's wrong if they think about part enough. If you hear that and then wait five minutes and they're still on that, that's when I'll go around and be like, hey guys, you might want to look in your notes for that definition of blank. And then I'll walk away. That's all I say. I don't say, I don't discuss, I just say, hey, look at this, and I go. But before you do that, are they communicating? Are they relying on each other before coming to you? In other words, are they whipping their head over to you every time they make a statement? And what is the group to do that? I've had groups who every time they do a step, you have one student in there, he checks this, he says, we think it's this. We think, you know, they think it's this, but I think it's this. Okay, well, discuss. Why do you think it's this? And so you can kind of intervene there, but it's very minimal. Is the group focused? Obviously, is are they on the right track? Are they in the right direction? If not, should you intervene? Is it a behavioral intervention or is it a content intervention? If they, everybody is sitting there not talking on their cell phones, clearly go intervene. Okay, but if it's just a matter of everybody kind of sitting there thinking on their own, let it take on their own for a few minutes. That's the individual work time. And then you might need to go over there after five minutes and be like, okay, guys, what are we thinking? And just asking, what are we thinking? Different people are going to stop things off, and now you go, okay, I like your idea, and I like your idea. Y'all just got those. You walk away. I'll have to spend enough time thinking about questions, goes along with those things, and then can I ask a question that helps them? Okay, so again, the questions. The students will hate you at the beginning. They really will. Because you're going to answer most questions with a question. And as a student, I can tell you that drove me crazy to answer a question, to get an, a response to a question from my question. Because I want to know the answer. And it took me a long time to realize 
I'm going to get the answer, but I'm going to make it, which means I'm going to understand it better. So, questions can always be things like, sometimes they're like, well, what does so-and-so think? If it's someone in the group asking, well, what does your group think about your answer? What does the group as a whole think? And then again, sometimes it's like, well, can you write down the definition of a derivative? Can you write down um, what it means for something to be increasing? And so that's the anticipating part from the beginning because I, if I haven't worked the problem, I've at least thought about where it's going to go so that in my mind I know what the big ideas are I needed to recall for that week to help that recall. And then again, I put it in all caps here. Never give something that you see wrong. Just don't. You actually break the entire problem solving experience for them. Even if you just give them one step. Not only does it derail the train that they're having to pick back up on, but students who actually successfully do problems all by themselves, you see this just sense of pride well up. And even if you give them just the tiniest bit of help at the end of it, most of the time I see that turns to, okay, so I did it. And it goes from, wow, I did it, to, okay, I did it. So, of course, I put a lot of information up here so far about how to implement, what it looks like to implement ideas and so forth, but as I'm going through this, several of you probably went, okay, well, here's a problem, here's another problem, here's another, you're, you're picking things that you're going, oh my gosh, I implement that. So, of course, more challenges have popped up just in the span of my talk, so here's more challenges. <laughs> So, how do you address deficiencies in the context of challenging problems? So, in other words, part of what these entry based activities are for is to not just give them challenging problems for the sake of challenging problems, but to help them learn material that they did not have time to learn in class or on their own. So, how do you address those while giving them something challenging rather than just spoon feeding it to them? And part of that goes into the worksheet design, which I'm going to put up a worksheet here in a minute for you to see so that you can get an idea. But it, it's very careful planning. The good news is I also have some tricks for you so that you're not spending an hour a week developing one worksheet. Uh, how do you manage the dynamic evolution of positive relationships? You will, as a facilitator, have to manage the groups. Um, you will also want to have the best relationship you can with your students, which seems silly and obvious. So, but again, students work well, best in a non stressful environment. And if they feel comfortable looking at you as they're working and being like, so what are you doing this weekend? All the better in my opinion. But you want to be able to address the group and be like, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong, without them going to take because they're not going to work for you. Um, how do you promote the student uh, interactive questions? Again, you want to answer them in such a way that you're always pushing back into the group. Everything that you comes out of your mouth should direct back to the group and lend a lack of scenario. Because I may answer for real five questions in the entire, thing, entire time. The rest of the time, I'm always pushing back to the group. You need to try to try to do this. Um, I do not anymore when I please. I do not bring the answers with me to the problems because I have the answers with me. I'm more likely to actually answer. If students ask me what's the answer, my response is I don't know. I haven't worked this because I know how to work it, but I have not worked that particular problem. So I don't know the answer, so I can't give it to you. Um, and I can also tell you that. It's kind of rare for me to even pick up a pencil during these. I will sometimes pick one up if I'm telling the student what's going wrong and they're just not doing it, I'll pick it up and I'll mark on the lead. But I don't carry paper and pencil with me most of the time because again, I'm tempted to sit down and physically work something with them. Whereas I only want to do that if I have to. Normally I carry a dry erase marker in my pocket. And so that way if I do have to address something, I put it on the board 
and then I'll say, I'll break the board. I'll put it up on the board and say, hey guys, I just put some comments up on the board about problem four. Um, you all might benefit from it, and then it's a whole class. Everybody can turn look at it, but I'm not individually addressing a student. And then again, mountains can group work with whole class discussion. That table that I saw, the pie chart I put up there, some of you might be going, man, that's 50 minutes. How do you do a wrap up in 50 minutes? And the trick is what I have found is taking targeted questions, less is more, give them just a couple of nice ones to work on, and then the discussion at the end when you're pressed for time can always just kind of be a, a what do we learn from this kind of thing. And if it's a, you will get a student, you know, poll the groups, what did y'all learn, what did y'all learn? And sometimes they'll go, I learned nothing because I have no idea what happened. And now you know, okay, that's where we're going to enter, to intervene. Let's discuss what actually happened, pull on those. And that, again, comes from having a really positive relationship with students. If they respect you, if they like you, if they're comfortable with you, they'll say, I didn't learn anything because I am really confused about what a derivative is. Whereas if they're not comfortable with you, they're going to kind of sit there and stare, or they're going to be like, derivatives, yay, and you're going to get nothing. They, they shut down. Okay, so let me put a worksheet up. Before we move on to that, I think there's a another question in the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing one, but let me see if I can Oh, yes, I apologize. Uh, let's see. I've managed time to treat your people who have been a long time to have problems, but I find myself getting answers. I want to sure we cover on here. Okay, so that's a great question, and I was going to bring this up somewhat in my implementation summary that I'm going to give. Um, I put questions on there that I want them to know how to do everything, but if they can do any part of it, I feel like they've been successful. So, I tend to put questions on these activities that are independent of each other so that they don't have to get the whole worksheet in order to get something out of it. And I also don't raise the entire worksheet. All right, that's the stress level. Down. So, if I really see a, student, a group of students just struggling on something, that's when I'll sometimes go over and be like, okay, guys, I see you're stuck on the same problem for a while. What's going on? And then when they say, we just cannot figure this step out, then I go back to my monitoring, monitoring results that I've done throughout the day, and I've gone, okay, wait, group three had a real nice way of doing this. Hey, guys, now you all go over to group three real quick and talk to them. And I will literally send either one or two or the entire group over to group three, walk over there and say, hey, guys, can you spend five minutes explaining to them what you did here? And that way, it's still not me doing it. The students are still going from each other, but now they're getting on the right track. And if they don't complete their work that I do want them to do within the time, they do get an extra week. It's due, like, the next time we do an inquiry day. But they have to do it as a group. And I will also hand out, if um, if I feel it's necessary, I have some, like, group evaluation forms where it's like, I think the way that I haven't had to use one in a while, but I think the way I have it set up is every person has found the name of all their members, including themselves, and then give the score zero, one, or two to each person. And if you do not score at least an average of a one, you do not get credit for your group work. And they also have to grade themselves. And believe it or not, students are more honest than you think about it. Very rarely will they give themselves a two, and I've seen them do zeros. It was like, everybody's giving a zero, I'm going to own it. And they'll just go. With it. So I think that answers the question of um, structuring the activity in such a way that they can work on smaller pieces at a time without having to necessarily build on everything 
is a good way to do it. Scaffolding problems is still good, but if you've got an activity that's 10 parts and they have to get through all 10 parts to get to the meat and the punchline of it, that's going to be tough in a classroom setting. That's a better, in my opinion, like class project than a classroom setting. Um, so this is a worksheet that I've used before. I've modified it several times. This is just the one I have to meet. So the first thing I actually put, obviously I put the, top, the topics of what's going to be covered at the top. That way the students have the worksheet, they can actually sit down and go through, oh, where's this on sequences and series. The second thing I've always done, and students really appreciate this, is anything above this line is the previous exam question. So these are things I have put on an exam in the past. These are much more straightforward questions than what's going to be on the And so that way the student can differentiate between here's what's going to be expected on the test, here's what I expect you to do during the problem. And it comes you down, and this is also what I require them to do on the board at the beginning. Every group has to get up to the board as a group. No one is allowed to sit down. And they have to work both of these problems on the board together. And before they're allowed to start anything here, they have to call me over and I have to say yes or no, that's fair. If the answer is no, I sometimes just say, no, it's wrong. And let them keep talking, or if it's something small, I'll walk over and be like, wrong, and walk away. And so it gets them talking. This is a great, it's an icebreaker, basically. It makes the group start talking. They, because, again, they're going to walk in and they're going to be like, okay, we're here. And if you make them do this, you get them on their feet, off their butt, they start working, they start talking, then they're going to jump into this and actually interact as a group rather than five individuals sitting at the table together. Okay, so these are rope problems. So I, these are normally pulled out of a textbook, to be honest. Um, so then these are the kind of problems that you will see on in my in my inquiry based activities. So explain the difference between the following and an example. Okay, so not work this problem out. That's not inquiry based. Talk about it. Right. I will tell you, in a math course, in the inquiry ones in my recitation, I require my students to write paragraphs. You cannot do math without the English, is what I tell them. And so I want them writing paragraphs, and I grade grammar. <laughs> so I'm that guy. And it sets them up for success in their later courses when they, gra and they graduate and they go off and get a job, and they haven't learned how to write a memo yet. They give them practice. And what I tell them all the time, because the first few weeks, you will have to come in and try to hand you a stack of work. And I'm like, I'm not ready. Well, why? And I'm like, when you're in your job and they ask you to do something, are you going to walk up and hand them a stack of papers and be like, well, everything I did is in here? Or are you going to type up a nice summary for them? Well, yeah, I guess I should type up a summary. I said, okay, go take that, write it up nicely for me, give it back to me next week. And I still let them turn it in. But I'm not going to take it and track for it. So I make them write sentences. I have them actually explain things. They have to write down what they're doing. Um, I've got some different questions. What can you say about the sequence that converges and each one's an integer? Hey, that's something we'll talk about in class. That's not something that's covered in the book. That's something that we're going to have to sit and think about. Uh, make an argument. So I'm not going to physically prove anything. I want them to at least give a reasonable argument for it. Uh, state here. So these are some of these are more straightforward. This is covered in class. Uh, this is an example that probably we might have done in class, but I want them to do it concretely. And then this next step is taking this number and changing it to a variable. So now I'm generalizing and making them think more critically. Um, and then the last step on that one is an application of C to do D. Uh, let's see. This is a nice, uh, number five here is a nice application problem. That again is not immediately straightforward. The use of, in order to solve this, 
you have to use what's called a geometric series. But you'll notice that nowhere in this problem is the phrase geometric series used. Okay? They have to look at it and pick out words like one piece of it or removing um, and recognize that those are going to be the D kind of tells you it's geometric because of the ratios we talk about, and the removing of the form to have to do with subtractions instead of additions and so forth. So it makes them think about it. And then as pure as you like, we talked about class a little bit, as you like, it's kind of a trigger word for a limit in calculus. And so that hopefully will get them thinking, okay, well, I need a limit of some sort. Uh, let's see. And then I also put fun ones like this on, um, something that's kind of abstract, but just gives them something cool. So the point of this one is you start making uh, like circles within circles or squares within squares, and so it's an infinite amount of them shrinking inwards, and I want them to find the sum of all the areas. And these are actually pretty challenging. You can see that some, well, some of them are easier. I think the, I can't remember if it's Twitter or the triangle is the hard one. Uh, but the, sometimes I'll give hints in class or sometimes on the worksheet to help them out. Um, sometimes I'll come up and I'll like help draw the diagram or something. Because some of them I actually, I expect it to take some time. And then, this is something you did in class. Yeah, this is working on something we did in class, so this is more of a road problem. Um, but you see, this is not stuff that you really cover in class, and it's, it's nothing way beyond what you do, because I'm not introducing new topics or anything like that, but I'm building more deeply on what we've already done. And I'm going to give you ideas as to where these type of problems come from, because at first glance, you're it looks like I took a long time writing it. And I really did. And see how I missed to do it at all. There we go. Okay, so a quick story for you um, as to how I implement it. So, Students are given one of these worksheets with enriched problems, which I'm what I mean by that, and I'm going to talk about more about it in a moment. Um, related to material from the previous week. That's very important. I never put anything on an inquiry-based activity that I covered that week. They give them time to digest it. They'll have time to do their online homework and so forth. They can actually start thinking. The week they learn it, they're just busy trying to figure out what is going on. They can't start thinking more deeply. Um, they're supposed to be did in groups. If they need to finish outside of class, they can. But again, they have to do it in a group, and they have to prove to me that they're working in a group. And they cannot. I do not allow divide and conquer. Let me put it that way. I tell them all the time, you are not allowed to divide and conquer. If I get, if they return into me in class, and I see that it's different handwritings or whatnot, that's fine. But if they turn into me outside of class and I see totally different handwritings on all these different problems, I'm going to call the group over and be like, okay, who did what? And they have to justify to me that they really didn't just all work on these individually, that they just had different people writing different parts, or that different people took leads, but that actually did at least meet up and talk. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, okay, who did this one? I did. Okay. And I'll turn to the other person in the group and I'll be like, explain to me what they did. And I'll even hand them the work and say, explain to me what they did. And I've given them the work, so even if they weren't the lead, they should still be able to read through it and at least tell you what in general happened. Um, I mentioned this before. I randomized the first half, make permanent groups after. I do take input. I do not let them pick their own groups. I, I just don't. It, it does not work in my opinion. I've had some pretty bad results. I will also say, I mentioned this before, groups of three to five. Uh, four is the ideal number in my opinion. You get better group work with three. I will be honest. The problem with doing three is if one person is absent that day, it goes down to two. 
and you get four hundred report for two people. And there's not enough mining in the room. Um, and I like to pick my groups beforehand. So I can change them on the fly if I need to, but I like kind of have a plan out before, and so I don't like to do three. If you do five, someone in that group can hide. There will be four people working really well, and there's a good chance that this person is going to sit there and pretend to be working well, but they're really not going to, and they really don't have to because there's enough other people there. Never do more than five. You, it, it does not work. Um, now, here's how I deal with everything in the worksheet. How do I get them to cover everything? When I give these, I actually do, quote, unquote, extra credit for the inquiry based Problems. Now, here's what I mean by this, because notice I put in quotation. Uh, if you turn in nothing, your group does not submit it, you get a negative score. So I tell them that. Basically, the way I do it is if we have three inquiry based activities throughout the, uh, uh, let's say we do one a week and there's three between exams, I'll tell them you can get up to two points on each inquiry based activity for your exam. Okay, so if they do all three and they do them all perfectly, that group will get plus six on the exam. That is perfect. If it was on the right track, but they made some mistakes, it's not quite there, they get one point for each activity. If they tried and it's just not, not there, like there's a lot of work here, but it's not quite. They try, I'm not going to penalize them. They get no extra for that. They get zero. Okay. But it's okay. If they did nothing, if they did not turn anything in, the problems I picked up were blank, they get a minus one. Okay. So in the grand field, it's not that bad. They're going to lose three to five points okay, on their exam. Okay. And they're told this up front. Most groups will turn in something. Okay, so I have almost never had to actually give a negative test. Almost never. But it gives me motivation to actually do it, but it also doesn't stress them out trying to get the entire worksheet done. They can just get the parts I'm asking for, and they can do it at their own pace. And if they don't quite get to it, they won't quite get to it. It's okay. okay. They're still learning. Um, and then I do selected problems from each worksheet. That worksheet I showed you had five or six problems. I don't expect them to do that entire worksheet. It would take them hours, and I mean hours, to do that entire worksheet. When I was working them out, it would take me an hour to two hours to do the entire worksheet. And now, that was as a grad student as well, so it's not quite as bad as it sounds, but it still would take them hours. So the way I actually do it is I start by having them work on anything they want. And sometimes I'll give them one, but let's say I'm picking up two problems. Sometimes at the beginning I'll say, okay, y'all pick your favorite problems to work. Or sometimes I'll say, okay guys, I'm going to pick up at least number one and then maybe something else. And then about halfway through the class, after they've had time to work on stuff, then I'll say, okay guys, here are the problems I'm picking up. So they've worked on some things, but now they can change gears. If you tell them at the beginning you're only picking up problems one and two, problems three through five will never get touched. You never, ever, ever get touched. So if you let them work on whatever they want to, they work on what interests them as a group, piques their interest, makes them more interested in the topic, then you focus them in about halfway through on what's actually going to get picked up. Um, sometimes I'll also do things like I'm picking up number one and any other problem. So then they get to actually turn in what they worked on for you and they can take that sense of surprise thing. Okay, so there's ways to do it. Those are just some ideas I've done in the past. But I definitely always let them work on whatever they want and then I pick a small subset of the problems to actually pick up for this. You pick up too much. They're going to stress out that they have to If you pick up too little, they're going to think, okay, well, this really doesn't mean anything. And what they also don't realize is by giving extra credit on these, I'm giving six points on an exam that's worth 10% of their grade. So, 
So, yeah, it's still not that much. But it makes them feel good. Okay, and then again, as the facilitator, my job is to walk around the room, answer questions, or direct questions, not answer them. And um, I pretty much tell myself I always need to be talking to a group or at least listening to a group. Because when you get like this, and about halfway through the semester, your students become very independent. And you're going to find that you may not have to intervene as often. But I still make sure and I tell myself I'm always going to be walking around the room. I'm always going to be sitting with a group or standing, you know, off the side like this between groups, actively listening. And you have to kind of train yourself to not fall into the, okay, good, they're working. I can kind of think about this other thing I've been thinking. You, you have to kind of train yourself not to do it. It's an easy trap to fall into. Because you're going to feel like you're not doing anything. You really are. And the first few times you do this as a facilitator, once it starts working, you're going to feel like you're not doing much. And well, because you're doing a lot of the beginning work and a lot of the intervention work, which in my opinion is hard. But at the very beginning, you're going to be busy. I remember my first two days, I was exhausted because I was running between groups here, 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 here. And as they got more independent with it, I was able to kind of take a step back. And I remember the first day of my second semester, I was standing at the corner of the room and I was like, yeah, I could teach this forever. This is easy. And then I was like, Oh, wait, I worked for three hours and all this stuff was prepped. So, yeah, so not so easy. Okay, so. Uh, let's see. For new teachers who are learning to manage classroom already, this sounds more challenging to implement as a teacher, but more rewarding to students. Are there tips to to a fairly green instructor? Um, I would absolutely recommend at the beginning to start small rather than trying to do a full day thing. Maybe start with a half class activity with just one problem with the group. Um, that's a little easier to create at the beginning. And if it's not going well, it only doesn't go well for about 20 minutes rather than the whole day. And I would also recommend those five practices. Really think about them. And you will find that the classroom management in terms of things like behavior is not as bad as it sounds. Most of the students will work on their own, and you can kind of just kind of walk by and be like, yo, phones away. And they'll put the phones away and get them. Um, in terms of the preparation, this is more challenging than direct lecture because you're having to anticipate what's going to happen at any given time. So I would encourage you, like I said, to start small. Start with topics that you're more familiar with. And then as time goes, if you teach the course over and over again, you can kind of branch out. You don't have to start with a worksheet like I made that was, you know, the, uh, the, that's something that was developed for years and years and years over and over again. So it can start looking like that. And I was nowhere near as good at this back then as I am now. So it really is a, a learning process for it. Um, my next thing is actually show you how to create those worksheets simply. So I think that will also help if you're concerned about just starting out how to handle it. Um, so when you make these worksheets, you want to make what are called rich problems for these collaborative assignments. Um, and I said this at the beginning, students are only going to collaborate if they feel like they need to. So you want the problems really rich. Now, what, what do I call a rich problem? Well, it means be based on the ideas or problem-solving strategies they've learned. Again, I said mathematical, but they don't have to be mathematical. Um, they need to be easy to understand, which sounds silly, but you can give some really awesome application problems and things of that nature. And the students, if you have to spend 30 minutes explaining to the student what the problem is and what the procedures in general should be, it's not a good problem. They may be able to pick up and kind of look at it thinking on their own review. I will also say application problem does not mean problem solving problem. 
just because you make it a word problem or just because it doesn't use a fixed equation does not make it a good problem solving. It needs to be able to be done in multiple methods. It needs to be something they can think about, something they can get wrong and play with. But it should not be something that instead of solving 3x plus 4 equals 5, you make a word problem out of it. That doesn't make it a uh, problem solving. Um, these two, it's very totality, take effort, take time. These should not be five minute problems, but they shouldn't be 30 minute, uh, they shouldn't be 30 hour problems either. They need co collaboration, be solvable in several different ways, what I just mentioned. Um, it should initiate a discussion, and that discussion should bring this up. So you want problems that at the end of it, they don't just kind of go, okay, yeah, that was the answer. You want something that they kind of look at and go, is that the answer? Like, is that how we, what did we do to get there? And then the students kind of talk, and then the group next door goes, are y'all talking about number two? Yeah, we did it this way. Oh, we got the same answer, but this doesn't look the same. So now you're fostering some questions. Um, it should act as a bridge between fields, if it can. They, and not just, I have been, I have not mapped because I'm used to talking about this at that point. But the uh, problems that mix math and biology, I've done problems that mix math and history. I've done problems that mix math and history. I have an average repository, but I have a repository that several students, uh, student workers helped me make years ago who were more understanding chemistry and physics than I did helped me write calculus problems that went into chemistry and went into physics and so forth to plug into the if I had students who I thought would benefit from. Um, and then the last one I think is an interesting idea, but if you can do it, you want to create problems that will influence the teachers and the students both to formulate interesting the one of the assignments I gave the second time I taught calculus two was the first day, and there was a problem in the previous exam question that the students worked, and I went over to a group and I went, okay, that's right, same answer I got, and then I walked over to another group. And they had a totally different answer. And at first, I went, okay, that's not proper. And then I looked at it and I looked through their work and I was like, their work's not wrong. But it doesn't look anything alike. I mean, nothing alike. But then I saw in numbers and I was like, wait, what's going on here? And so I went back and I said, okay. I think y'all are right. I'll be honest, it's not the answer I thought it was, but it looks like it's right. So let me figure out what's going on. So I put it in my back pocket. I went back to my office after class. I sat down and I was actually able to show that this person's answer and this person's answer would be equivalent, even though they looked nothing alike. And do a trick in it. And so on the next worksheet, I had a problem at the end that literally walked them through and I said at it on the top of it. Last week, several of y'all got this as an answer. Some of you got this as an answer. This problem will help you understand why. And then it was part walking them through the derivation I did in order to help them understand how those answers arrived. So it was a teachable moment. And it was something that I had sure never seen. I had never seen anything like that. So it made me start thinking, and I was able to add more problems to the worksheets later because of it. Okay, so that's what risk problems are. Now that you're all terrified, how do you actually build these things? So this is a internet guide that I took from Dr. James Alvarez out at University of Texas at Arlington. He was my mentor uh, when I was doing my uh, ORIS facilitation. He was one of the head of ORIS. And this is his guide that he came up with with students for taking a standard problem and creating a really rich problem out of it. Now, the reason why I like this guide is because this standard problem in the middle can be from the book. You can take a simple book or problem or something you talk about in the lecture and then do these things to it 
not all of them. Please don't do all of them. We'll freak everybody out. Um, but do one, two, however many, and create a really rich problem. So take, we're going to give examples of several of these that are not clear as to what they are. Okay, but you can take standard problem and you can invert it. Okay, give them the answer, ask for the question, basically, and play Jeopardy with it. Um, you can ask for prediction at the start. That was probably my least favorite, just because I don't feel like students really like make prediction questions. They tend to skip that question, go work it, and then write the correct prediction at the top. Okay, so I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, scaffold the problem to break it to easier chunks. Ask for multiple representations. Problems that you're putting on here should be able to be solved in different ways. So give multiple representations. Have them answer it graphically, graphically, and in English. Uh, qualitative reasoning. Questions that don't necessarily have a right answer. Okay, just something that they need to reason through and do an argument for. Um, automaticity versus automaticity, not drill and kill. Okay, this is something that a lot of people um, mess up on. Drill and kill is what we were all subjected to in elementary school with multiplication tables, where we got the multiplication tables for three, 37 times in a week, and had to down and fill it in over and over. That's drill and kill, and you learn nothing. And you learn how to process. Automaticity is where you give them problems that are linked up by some common practice, and you give them enough of them that eventually that common practice comes into their head. So in other words, we're not going to give them 15 equations that all relate, they're all just different numbers, but I might give them 15 equations that all need to be factored. Okay, so then they go to a different problem, they're going to go, oh yeah, factor. That's right. After generalization, after counter symbols, after explanation. Those are all more straightforward. Um, so let me show you what I mean by doing some enhancements with this. So for each of these, what I have in the box is the textbook question, and then this is the technique I've used, and then down here I'm going to put the actual problem that I put on the worksheet. So a standard question that we might ask in a college algebra course could be something like, given a function x over 2 over x, x plus 2 over x minus 1, find all vertical horizontal asymptotes. Okay, that's something we teach like halfway through. It's pretty rough problem. If you want to invert the problem, you can say, you can say, here, give me an example of a, I say problem, a function that has a y intercept of 2, an x intercept of minus 2, this horizontal asymptote, this, and this vertical asymptote. And it has to be all of these. So now they're thinking backwards. And so rather than using the algorithm that they learned to go from here to the, from the function to the answer, they have to start here and build that thing, which is a much more challenging problem for them in general. They can make that thing. Uh, another standard problem we probably ask in a calculus question in a calculus class. Um, so this is an example of scaffolding as well as um, generalizing it. It kind of met a few categories on this. But so I decided to apply to this to a different branch of math rather than just calculus. I want to go into some geometry. So you can see it's a much more complicated problem, but it's broken into parts. So rather than just having them compute that limit, I'll say, okay, what should I decide to follow on? What are the possible values for in? Okay, I wanted to get to whole numbers, you know, uh, integers that are possible. Okay, you can't have fractional size, you can't have negative size, and things like that. What's a regular polygon? All sides are equal, all sides and angles are equal. What's a regular three dot? Equal out of a triangle. What's a regular four dot? A square. Okay, and then I give them that same formula up there, slightly modified, I have an extra term in there, and have them use the formula to compute the areas of these shapes that they've already had. So they know how to do the areas, but I want them to do these ones. Then this part right here, 
if you increase the number of sides of a polygon without bound, what you get, you get a circle. And use the formula for to justify your area. So what I want them to do is base in go to infinity. Take the number of sides to infinity. If they do, this actual equation will turn into pi r squared. And so it goes, if they computed that right there, they would have gotten pi squared. They, because I didn't have the r. So I went from that into let's really compute something that would be meaningful to and this is a problem that I put on, I think, the second time I taught the course, and the students were absolutely ter are absolutely terrified of it the first time they see it. And then by the end of the problem, most of them go, okay, that was really cool. I always wondered where the error, uh, where the area of the circle came from. And this is one way to go, but they appreciate it. Uh, qualitative reading, standard question. How many zeros does the tab? College algebra students can do this. It's not too hard. If you're doing a calculus course, you can ask them to instead of finding, you can say, what are the zeros? You'll ask the same question. But then you'll be able to tell them to subline, and then using the problem as a guide and the theorem, outline the process for determining where the function is positive or negative. It's not making an application, and it's going way beyond, and it's not an algorithm at all. They're going to have to reason through why their algorithm, their algorithm that they're creating is going to work. Uh, again, generalizing question. Rather than just having to find a limit, I might ask them to find a limit, and then I'll also ask them to take the limit of something more complicated. But they use the same strategy that this is. Like when you're solving this, you can pretty much take this, replace this in with T of N, with, excuse me, with this, and it'll all work out. It's all right. Okay, so they don't have to do a whole lot new, they just have to be able to transcribe it. And uh, after that, this is one of my favorites. This problem actually appears, this is a partial problem that appears on my Calculus 1 pre tower review worksheet. And there are actually not just two, there's like 10 of these. And rather than just asking and simplify, I have to give them this. Below is a list of simple algebra problems. Some of the solutions are wrong. For each problem, determine if the answer is correct. Determine if there's any mistakes in solving it. And notice I think just because the answer is correct does not mean there are no mistakes. So sometimes we'll get students who make just the right mistake and they get the right answer. And then I'll say, if there's any problems with it, you have to rework it correctly. And so, for example, on this one, one. This is a common student work. So over the years, you compile some work, you know what mistakes are made. Here, they're breaking the fraction incorrectly and they're canceling. And on this one, they miraculously get to the right answer. But it's very wrong. And so the students have to pick up that here to here is a mistake. And a lot of the students make this mistake themselves. So it takes a group in order to determine that it's not right. And somebody in that group knows this mistake. They, but not everybody does, because some students will believe it. And then if this one, they're distributing squares incorrectly and getting zero, not only is the work wrong, but the answer is also wrong. So this is a little bit easier for them to pick up. Um, I tell them I'll get numbers to see if it's right or wrong, and so on and so forth. And then there are a few that are right. And typically ones that are right, I didn't put it on here because I didn't have space, it's right in some weird algebraic way. Like, they're doing steps that aren't normal steps that they might think to take, but they are correct nonetheless. So it teaches them to get some actual practice with their algebra. Uh, the students, I have found, respond very well to this in terms of learning, because you will get students who want to do this, and when you show them, hey, this isn't right, they're like, oh, okay. And at least it saves you back their mind. And this is just automaticity. Um, 
again, rather than just asking for a basic limit, I'm going to ask them for a whole bunch of limits here. But all of them use the same idea. Pretty much everything up here uses some form of factor. Okay, even if it's just a little baby factoring. Most of it uses some form of factoring in order to so I want them kind of thinking about factoring as it goes. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Um, this last part about building the rich problems, again, I, I try to bring up just to kind of temper this because I know it can be overwhelming, especially for new teachers who have never, or teachers who have never done anything like this in a classroom. And it is more challenging at the beginning because you lack the control that you feel. When you stand up in the front of the room, you are at the front of the room and you control what is going on. And unless something really catastrophic happens, you can control the students and do exactly that class classroom will run exactly how you want it to run. But when you go out inquiry based and you're letting them problem solve, things happen. And so it is intimidating, but hopefully the ideas I've presented here can kind of for that and give you some ideas as to how you can implement it in your own class. So, thank you for your time. I have a yes. <laughs> um, so I've done uh, running courses like street lecture, I've done some more inquiry-based courses before, and mm -hmm. I think reviews came back when I did lecture, they're like, this instructor knows what she talks about. She has good um, common knowledge. And when I did inquiry-based one, they're like, this instructor needs to learn more science, like they don't know what they're talking about. Have you seen that in your student reviews? Um, I do not because I do not, I have yet to run a full inquiry base that's not connected to a lecture. And so that to me is one of the key components. I, I didn't write it up here, but I kind of just when I said that the students have to, um, you wait a week after you present it in a lecture to really talk about it. Because when the students are learning everything on their own in that sense, with inquiries, you get a lot of that where they're not happy with it because you're not answering a lot of questions. They think you don't know what you're talking about. And they get frustrated very quickly because they don't have that grounding. So the first thing I always recommend when you're doing inquiry-based is A, to not do a pure inquiry-based class unless it's like a senior level or graduate course. It works better. Uh, but for the kind of students that we would typically teach these to, like freshmen and sophomores, I would say if you need to find a way, whether it's a lecture, at home, a video, something to give them a firm foundation, and then start the inquiry. And if you're doing at home videos, I would absolutely recommend that you're the one doing the videos, because then you do have the knowledge, you're just presenting it to them differently.
break it down to where you give them like a pre-activity that has a lot of the hard questions on it, and they're going to do that at home or in a group, not in class. And then when you come into class, you have a quick discussion of the pre-activity, and then you give them the real activity. And then they get into the pre-activity with them, and they can kind of go, okay, in that pre-activity, we did this. And it cuts everything out to like all six to one minute. Um, but uh, if we want to, in a lot of my time, get to go all the part, and I have had to back off, like, uh, in a three or three years, so much here and here, I have started to do this, and I'll have to serve, I think, this isn't going to work, and so I start, it's not going to work in this form, and so I started giving these as more tape. I gave the same work to but I gave them to them as students as take home projects. It does not work as well at all. Um, you either get perfect ones, which to me, okay, they're probably getting help, or you get a lot of problems. And so I do not like doing it at all, but when necessary, it still kind of works and it still gets around there. But it, it is a balancing act to get all the material covered. And like in abstracts, I'm struggling this time. I had to, I'm not going as far into it this semester as I normally do. I have the same question. Yeah.
they normally a group member would come up, staple their work, and put it on a desk. And when that happens, depending on where we are in the semester, sometimes I would say, okay, y'all, sometimes I'd pick a problem and be like, hey, did y'all do number five? No? I think you'd like number five. Go to number five. And so it keeps them back on inquiry stuff. Or if it's like the week before a midterm, I'm going to be like, go do your online work. You have a midterm coming up. And so I'll let them kind of go more into the rote work, just start preparing for the test. But the more intensive, the more time you have, obviously you can do more, but students finish. But I would still say the worst I've ever seen is like a quarter to half the class in the term. Like, like, like the next. Any other questions? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, right. So, right. Right. So the question is, what does the literature say about this implementation approach? Um, <clears throat> what we found is that weekly obviously works best. And when it comes to trying to implement it over time, what the literature says, or not over time, periodically rather than weekly, we found, and it agrees with the literature says, is that you're going to first not see as rapid growth. You're going to see that there are certain topics they're going to understand better, but not their overall knowledge is not going to be as increased. Uh, you're also going to find that there's less kind of self-efficacy and, and less, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Less interest in the work. They, because they feel like if you don't implement it often enough, they kind of feel like it's contrived rather than integrated into their kind of day-to-day. -day. Um, when we were doing this at UTA the, for the content-intensive workshops, the actual original model that was based off of Gary Reisman's results was a four-hour model. And they met twice a week for two hours at a time. And that was every week. And what happened was, as the, they followed that model for about two years, I think, and then the year I came on, uh, we came into discussions about how um, sustainable that was, both for students and for the instructor, because under that model, it was a different instructor. The lecture instructor and the recitation instructor was different than the workshop instructor. And so you had to pay for another instructor there. And so there was a question of, is this sustainable? So what we did was we dropped to a two-hour week model, where they met one day a week for two hours, in addition to their other materials. And we saw that there was a statistically significant drop in the results, both qualitatively and quantitatively. I believe there was a bigger qualitative drop than quantitative, but that there was still enough of a significant gain that the two hour was worth it. It just was nowhere near as worth it as the four hour one was. Um, now in terms of here, the doing weekly in the Cal 1 courses, I saw some really nice results. I saw a lot of progress. Um, as I mentioned, doing it, I did it about once every week. Three weeks in grade when I was doing take home. I did not great results with that, and I don't know per se if it was because of the take home or because it was only every three weeks. And this time in abstract is actually my first time doing in person spread out like that. Um, I confess I do not know what the literature says to expect on that one, but I'm actually very interested in seeing, and I'm working on a grant. Um, I'm a facilitator on a grant that is funding the materials I'm using for it. So they're actually going to be adding to the literature on how this works. So we should have some nice results on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if 